Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us today. My name is Bharat Anand, and I'm a partner in the corporate M&A team at Khetan. Um, uh, on behalf of the firm, I would like to extend each and every one of you a very warm welcome uh, to this uh, webinar series. This is the second webinar of our m and Master Series. Uh, of the second, uh, uh, this is the second uh, webinar in our MA Master Series in 2022, and we look forward to your company throughout uh, the entire series. We have an excellent program uh, this year based on feedback from participants uh, in last year's series, and we've been really thrilled with the sort of response we've received. We've had literally thousands of um, registrations for webinars across uh, the series. We're very grateful for everyone's interest and support, uh, which includes our clients, associates, and others that have shown the, uh, interest this year. Uh, today, uh, we are looking at private M&A from the perspective of uh, buyers. And uh, I just thought I'd set out on this slide the agenda that we have for the day. Uh, the format of uh, the session today is really a panel discussion between our expert panel followed by a QA. and a um, I'd encourage the audience that uh, to please uh, send across any questions in the chat feature that, that uh, chat feature that you see uh, uh, on, 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 on the screen in front of you. Uh, we've already received several questions from the audience. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to submit them using the facility provided. If we can't cover all the questions during the webinar, we'll certainly send you a response offline. And please note that after uh, the session is over you will be receiving a copy of the presentation and a summary of the notes that we'll be making uh, in terms of expert comment received um, so just uh, you know in terms of the topic uh, for today uh, how buyers can do private share acquisitions better and uh, obviously anyone who's been in an m a deal knows that every transaction is different every situation is different the dynamic between the buyer uh, seller and the asset is is, is very different um, but we will discuss uh, some of the common mistakes that people end up making, uh, particularly buyers end up making in a private M&A deal context and share learnings uh, that will help maximizing the chances of a successful deal. Uh, and the webinar is also very timely as you are seeing uh, India is witnessing a substantial uptake in M&A activity. There is a lot of cash, a lot of companies have burned a lot of cash and there are uh, visible targets around. Uh, in this, uh, webinar our panelists will focus both on m a deals um, uh, but uh, several of our panelists have experienced in growth situations as well uh, some of those issues are specialist issues but where relevant our panelists will touch upon issues that uh, transcend both growth uh, raising capital for growth situations as well as raising capital uh, in m a situations uh, let me just uh, you know uh, continue with making a quick introduction to the panelists that we have each person who is registered for the webinar today has received an email with full particulars of the panelists. Suffice it to say that all of them are m and experts with excellent credentials. We have three leading m and practitioners. Uh, we have Chandresh Ruparal, who's a managing director at Rothschilds in India. We have Puneet Ranjan, he's m and head, EVP and head of partnerships and alliances at the Mahindra Group. Uh, we have Rashmi Gupte, who's general counsel and CFO at Lightbox. And then we have two of my fellow partners, uh, Prasanji Chakravarti and Anuj Shah, both very experienced uh, M&A lawyers. So uh, <clears throat> let's uh, you know, kick off the proceedings in right earnest and get down to the questions. I'd encourage uh, participants and panelists to make this uh, conversational. Please share war stories. If you have any inputs on any of the points made by our co-panelists, uh, once the he or she is uh, over, please feel free to chime in. Uh, and I'd also request you to keep your responses to, you know, around uh, three to four minutes. Uh, in case we're losing time, please forgive me, I may have to cut across. But uh, Puneet, let me, let me start off with you. In your experience, what are the consequences of not executing an M&A deal well, particularly in the private M&A context? Maybe you could kick us off with that. Oh, Bharat, thank you so much and uh, glad to be here. Uh, the way I think about that question, I'll kind of divide it into three parts. The first is the process which is followed while executing an M&A transaction. I think the second is the key terms of the M&A transaction which you're executing. And you can actually go faulty on both of them. And the third is post-merger execution. I know a lot of my panelists will talk about it. But I'll probably just touch upon it, which will be a good segue for them to kind of talk about it. I think the, the first aspect is 
um, as consequence of if you are not following the due process you're effectively wasting a lot of management time and bandwidth because effectively that management time and bandwidth could have been used for not only operational work but other strategic uh, stuff which could really take the business uh, to a new direction and m a uh, process as we all know on this panel is extremely intensive whether it's diligence negotiations valuation and then eventually structuring the entire transaction i think the second is uh, the opportunity cost and the opportunity cost can be measured in both ways one is you're actually when you're executing a transaction and going very deep dive into it you're effectively losing out on other potential transactions which could be there and which could be very strategic and could be very interesting uh, from a business perspective and you're not really kind of embarking on those uh, while negotiating one particular transaction i think the second is opportunity cost of capital right because m a at the end of the day is going to take up capital uh, to be put into the business uh, for the time of acquisition and future acquisition, uh, future post-merger business plan funding, etc. If you're actually not executing the transaction very well, uh, what you're really doing is losing out on that capital, which could have been used for either other inorganic or organic initiatives, uh, as well as you know for business needs. I think the third aspect, uh, which is very very important. Uh, which buyers tend to most often ignore and if you see a lot of global companies are very conscious of that and most of my experience first as a banker and now as a M&A professional on the corporate side uh, we do find the most successful corporates who have actually integrated M&As better are the ones who are very very clear and conscious about their reputation as acquirers because it's very important uh, in especially in heightened deal environments you could tend to get over ambitious in terms of trying and evaluate various opportunities without really them fitting within your strategic box of evaluation criteria, uh, just because an opportunity is there. I think buyers have to be very conscious that if you're entering processes without really a serious intent, at some point in time, it will come back to hurt you with your credibility of uh, an acquisition of the buyer from a seller's perspective. Uh, I think the second is how do you conduct yourself during an M&A process from an execution perspective? Are you being just very onerous and rigid on certain things which are not very critical and just, you know, kind of incurring additional diligence time and effort from the seller's perspective and their advisor's perspective? I think that can also be quite onerous and it can hurt your reputation as the M&A, uh, you know, as an acquirer where uh sell side people can actually feel that these guys are just you know it's good to be uh in conversation with them but they will probably not close a transaction or they'll be just very rigid and not very flexible on doing a transaction and as we all know m a transactions at some point in time uh you have to find a win-win for both sides for a transaction to go through it's never one-sided right so i think that is uh the other aspect and then, uh, like I said, what is the downside risk for consumers of not executing a private M&A from post-integration perspective as well is effectively, if you haven't executed a transaction well, you're going to face issues in terms of integrating that or executing the business plan which you had kind of set out uh, from the whole process of the uh, acquisition. And that will also take away a lot of management bandwidth in addition to capital. And if you're a listed company like more, you know, we are a large group in India listed and we have multiple entities which are listed, that will start to kind of show on uh, both stakeholder interest in your business as well as from a valuation perspective. So I think it's very important hence to keep all of these in mind when you're structuring transactions uh, from a process perspective. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Puri. That's that's a really helpful overview of, uh, you know, some of the um you know real guardrails that one has to put in place in terms of an m a process and you know clearly uh you know this is one of those areas where uh there is significant uh potential uh downside and you really you really need um you know to have expertise and to watch over uh, what that transaction does um <clears throat> uh in terms of in terms of opportunity cost and how it can really blow out in your face if you run it badly uh, maybe I could I could turn to Prasanjit and then you know Rashmi maybe you know to talk us a little bit about uh, you know a little bit more detail and get let's get a little bit more specific in terms of common mistakes that you see buyers making in terms of really doing and implementing uh, private M&A transactions and you know specifically on the on the theme of the topic what is it that they can do better in the context of common mistakes that you guys have seen. 
Um, thank you, Bharat. Uh, if I may go first to this, and firstly, greetings to everyone who have tuned in for this uh, webinar. Uh, I think it's obviously our response, which can be very comprehensive, but three broad points uh, which crosses my mind is first is planning. Uh, I cannot overstate the importance of planning. As the great Benjamin Franklin said, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. And therefore, planning is fundamental, right from scouting the right set of targets which you're looking at as a buyer. Uh, and we all know, and at least I have seen in many cases where a side chat at a conference uh, you know, leads to an immediate signing of term sheet and there's hard buns thereafter. So nobody's saying don't meet people. Of course, do meet people in conferences. That's why conferences are there for, we all do. But be cautious in how you screen your target. Do your checks and balances, kick the tires and make sure your target is there. The second critical point is also extension of planning is also look at the cultural fit. It's very important that when you do cross-border m and especially, you are mindful, cognizant and respectful of the cultural fit. Uh, again, just to put the things in context, so remember there's a cross-border m and where a global fund was even prior to closing, drilled down all its lofty standards on the, uh, the client's uh, internal governance and other mechanisms. The result was that, well, a protracted negotiation, the cost became a huge debate. Who will foot the cost of such lofty standards to be implemented even before the deal closes? Sadly, the deal could not see light of the day. The third is keeping an efficient, experienced team. It again cannot be overstated because if you don't have efficient team all around, right, from bankers, financial advisors, lawyers, you're destined and doomed to fail. And give an example, uh, you know, which is very, very clear in my mind. There was a set of in-house advisors uh, who were advising a counterparty, uh, auditors and friendly related advisors. And they took so many theoretical positions on virtually each and every point that virtually the deal got tanked. Thankfully, sanity prevailed at the end of the day and we could go through the line, but not before lots of protracted negotiations. So three bullet points, I would say, plan, do plan very well, mindful of cultural integration as well, the software aspect, so to speak, and last but not least, have a good bunch of efficient advisors, which will take care of your deaf dog structuring and everything else. What do you put? Yeah, Rashmi, do you want to weigh in on this as well? I, I know you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, maybe, maybe I think uh, since Prasenjit just covered the first three, maybe I could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, over under valuation and diligence uh, and how you look at it. Uh, I think uh, Puneet said this very well. It has to be a deal where both are happy. Right, and therefore valuation is the crux of it because that's the price you're paying. Uh, I think uh, you know we've seen a, a massive uptick in M&A. I, I read today's paper which said there's 32 billion dollars in this year alone that has gone behind M&A funding. So I think uh, when the markets have enough liquidity, when the the economic situation is hunky dory, everyone's focusing on growth. You know, so you're looking at scale, you're looking at expansion, you're looking at paying a higher price. And when things start tightening up, which is expected to happen soon, everyone again goes back to a situation on valuation. They're looking at unit economics, profitability, focus on, on, on the, in the short to medium term first, get profitable and move from there. I think it's very important in an M&A situation to know if you're going, if you're investing in equity, then you have a medium to long term horizon and you can, you know, outside of your specific mathematical mathematical models of income approach, market approach, understand that valuation is not just these numbers. At the end of the day, it's also the gut feel of the buyer and seller. What the buyer expects uh, for this, the price that you pay has to over time get you the right value. And for the seller, you can't be shortchanged, right? Because you really need to get the price that is right either for your asset or for your equity valuation. So I think that is uh, fundamentally very important. Uh, having said that, uh, what we have seen, uh, especially in growth kind of transactions, is if there is some some debate around, you know, let's say what the numbers are going to look like, what the scale is going to be over time. If it's an equity kind of an investment, things like setting some kind of floors or caps, uh, which is linked to, let's say, future performance. Uh, metric driven, driven conversions uh, could be another approach. Another approach could be, though not ideal, would be to sort of break down your, your payouts over time and agree, uh, you know, that those would be tied into certain performance goals or metrics. Also incentivize the management, maybe retain a portion of that and then help them build to scale and then release the consideration. Now, 
these are various techniques where both the parties can come together and say let's arrive at a price that is going to deliver true value and not it it shouldn't be a game about oh i was overvalued or undervalued right and i think one one great example which which is very close to my heart because i'm i'm a movie buff is um, is the acquisition of pixar by disney right uh, this was way back uh, uh, in in the 90s but uh, what was amazing was at that point in time bob iger was heavily criticized for some seven and this is all public knowledge right some 7 billion plus that he paid uh, he did that because he wanted to scale storytelling and he wanted to give disney a fresh breath of air and say you know we are about animation we are about this new age company that's creating stories that are unparalleled and so you got toy story you got zootopia you got frozen you had moana and suddenly the 7 billion that was paid in the very initial stages recouped over 14 to 15 billion and the rest is history right so i think um, it's got to be a win win uh, rather than focusing on was it a valuation error yes of course uh, that doesn't mean you have you know you can err on the math- mathematical side of the equation but i think over time if the two work together you can really achieve some great outcomes on on pricing being right um the other part i would touch on is diligence uh, which is very important to my view i'm also a lawyer by trade everything needs to be checked uh, what we are seeing is the trend on diligence has moved away from pure finance or legal diligence right increasingly we are looking at or rather growth stage m and a deals are looking at the founder they're looking at the cxo team what's going on here other than what goes on in in closed cxo rooms or board meetings people are looking at social media audits people are looking at uh, you know generally integrity audits criminal kind of investigations to make sure and these are done discreetly but to make sure that are we really backing as a buyer the right kind of people who can take the ethos of the purchasing entity forward right and last but not the least and something that's very pertinent today is also an esg diligence to make sure companies are not necessarily trampling upon either their workforce or the environment or even from a governance perspective engaging in kickbacks and so on and so forth as they build to scale right so i think i i would say those are some of the key areas uh, that are important yeah fa- fantastic inputs rashmi thanks thanks a lot i think given the stakes uh, you know of the mna game and given what is at stake i think it's really important to have your priorities absolutely clear and then to back that up with the right rationale and not uh, you know simply have this uh, mindset of you know chasing a flip uh, we buy it if we don't like it you know we sell it because that really has long term uh, repercussions maybe maybe the flip is chandresh what you really like best so i'm going to maybe maybe just jump to you and then i've got a i've got a question uh, at the back end for both uh, puneet and rashmi and then i'll bring uh, anuj in but but chandresh how does deal process affect what buyers need to do to execute private mna deals well uh, for example uh you know bringing in here the competitive bidding uh, process as opposed to you know uh tying people down in terms of a bilateral exclusivity and then just negotiating bilaterally so please be share your views sure no thanks thanks bharat i think quite quite an important thing and i guess firstly the the indian mna market has matured quite significantly uh in in that sense that uh one the ownership structure of companies or businesses has undergone a radical change especially with a number of private equity or financial sponsors also playing a big role uh in that and hence in terms of transactability or the number of transactions the sheer number of transactions has increased which gives a lot of comfort uh you know to both buyers and sellers uh, about transactions being real and uh, you know a possibility of them happening so that is that is the first part but i would i would firstly say uh you know what puneet mentioned what prasen mentioned about preparation i think that is the biggest uh, you know part from a buyer perspective if you are a buyer which is in the market which already knows uh, what is the potential or what opportunity uh, you know in the market you know it emboldens the buyer a little more to make an approach i guess uh, that therefore determines on whether you know one should try and go bilateral or one should probably wait a bit because when when you are even going bilateral uh, in in all likelihood or in a number of circumstances you would have situations where uh, you know a potential buyer is a likely competitor and therefore any approach uh, you know has uh, the biggest risk that you know an approach can well be rebuffed uh, because the potential seller feels that you are outfishing for information 
so i guess in addition to preparation where you can confidently you know go ahead and make an approach the other part is really uh, you know about the conduct uh, you know of a buyer uh, so if the conduct is the one which is uh, you know more confident which probably is something uh, you know where uh, you know one is giving a sense that uh, this is a serious approach and it is something which is uh, well studied i think that results in a good bilateral conversation to have now increasingly like i specifically mentioned about financial sponsors i mean financial sponsors hold assets there is a defined uh, period for which the asset is to be held and there is a defined period when a trans, uh, where, where an asset can really get into play uh, so studying the asset uh, you know early on and probably after a period of time uh, making those discrete inquiries or you know approaching financial sponsors is not a bad thing to do uh, you know it's something which uh, the financial sponsors are are there to invest and to make money so they are open to such uh, you know kind of approaches that gives a sense of the marketability of their asset that gives a sense about uh, you know what kind of process they also need to run for something like this uh, i think the other point and an important point comes in uh, in addition to the the preparation and, and really the approach uh, and the conduct is 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 really about uh, you know how you plan the whole thing uh, in the sense that you really have to put down things as to what are the ones which are your priorities what are the ones uh, you know which are which are good to have as such and really focus on the large points there are there are aspects which are critical for example on one of the uh, you know transactions that uh, you know we were working on uh, you you had a situation where uh, the business is all about services and if there is a change in control for example uh, you know that happens then is there a risk of significantly large customers or contracts going away so uh, deriving a bit of comfort around that uh, you know those aspects are something if you well studied if you know how you are going to manage it i think it is something which gives even a counterparty comfort uh, you know around that i guess the 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 other part is is also uh, you know about how you conduct yourself during bilateral negotiations uh, and like i said i think there are large issues to tackle there are minute issues to tackle uh, it is always useful to have a champion uh, you know on the buy side uh who is the one who is really the the deal champion who is looking at a 30000 or a, a policy you know perspective uh, you know and and is supposed to be the leader uh, not going to you know look at uh, uh, you know some sort of uh, very very minute matters for that there is another person that one should have but effectively this this guy is really the ambassador for the deal and he is going to get uh, you know the deal delivered uh, you know for the buy side and he is a person who gives the maximum comfort Uh, you know he or she gives the maximum comfort to the counterparty uh, to say that uh, this deal is for real and there can be many many uh, you know uh, aspects around communication which come to play here uh, things around uh, you know giving comfort that uh, you know the the principal shareholders or the there is there is enough kind of backing uh, you know from the board or the shareholder side uh, there is enough uh, you know comfort around the financing therefore there is a lot of deal certainty uh, that can happen and i guess the last in the probably one of the biggest items that one can look at in any bilateral conversation is the time the time you get in and the time you get out is something uh, you know which is which is most important and that is something which puneet uh, you know referred to the more the time spent uh, you know on on any uh, transaction uh, and and probably a negotiation and the more you let it fester the higher the chance of the deal actually falling so to that extent uh, you know like i said the way the the buyer organizes oneself uh the timelines or you know the entire strategy with which uh, you know one is going in uh that that kind of really determines uh, the success of any transaction or yeah. kind of that that explains barat yeah no thanks thanks chandresh really really appreciate your insights because i think it's a bit of a myth right that people believe that look sellers are better served you know necessarily running an auction in all situations if the fit is good right to the points made earlier that you are doing it for the right strategic reasons people will stretch right and so many of us in our daily personal lives right if we really want something you know we'll stretch uh, whether it's the latest iphone and i'm trivializing here but you know all of us mentally you know if the fit is right you you make the stretch so i think it's a bit of a myth that look you necessarily need to run an auction process to to raise value and you know for sellers who take that approach and then say okay i've got an approach that's the baseline now let me run an auction and if you don't find a better fit then guess what you're only negotiating downwards from there right so i think uh, and really really important to have experts you know in the financial services side uh, to guide guide those decisions but the other new uh, you know sort uh, of but, but uh, if i can 
if I can just interject here, I've been pretty keen to give an example in a very live and a recent example where uh, you know we we exactly tried to do a bilateral uh, where we got a, a an overseas strategic. Uh, to make an approach uh, to a, uh, a financial sponsor on an asset which is a very very uh, you know specific asset so to that extent there are it's an as, it, it is an asset which probably has a fair bit of uh, investor int uh, investor interest alike but more strategic and it's a niche asset so uh, you know uh, it is it is something which can can make uh, you know a, a big entry position or strengthen the entry position for the uh, the global company that we were advising now this company got in uh, we got the conversation uh, you know opened we actually got into a kind of a bilateral discussion uh, we got uh, you know everything that is required to be done got in a term sheet as well then the question came in about the valuation and uh, you know our clients uh, you know thought that they because they were in an exclusive kind of a position so they they actually tried to uh, you know negotiate a bit uh, and, and that kind of uh, uh, literally meant that the sell side, uh, you know, developed cold feet and said that, you know, now just giving a bit of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a leeway here on an exclusivity, it's not serving us well. Uh, so they let the asset, uh, you know, be around for another year or so. And then, you know, we were approached here that why don't you guys help us sell this asset because you know the space well. So we went and sold the asset now. Uh, our first wife client, uh, you know, also happened to be one of the bidders. And I guess, I mean, it was just the way that they approached this asset. This went into an auction. And in that auction, unfortunately, they lost. So it is, it is, a, it is a perfect story about, you know, the conduct. And I guess, I mean, I'm not, I'm not kind of uh, to be, I mean, just to be clear, I'm not criticizing, uh, you know, anybody here. But it is just the way that you position yourself, uh, you know, even during an auction process, it's not that a buyer does not have a chance, but the, the, the view, uh, of the buyer, i.e., how is how is the buyer perceived, also changes uh, or or may get altered on how the conduct is all about. Correct, correct. Uh, uh, I think I think really invaluable insights. Um, I think there is a new uh, sort of party in town, right? It's been there for a while, but uh, it is a new trend, which is really in terms of you know corporate uh, venture capital, and uh, maybe you know I'll get. Uh, uh, Puneet, you and Rashmi to talk about this, but we we've been seeing places where large strategics are coming in, uh, investing in high growth companies, whether at early stage or at growth stage, or you know investing in companies backing really new ideas and new intellectual property. Um, in your experience, how is this collaboration really fared, and are, are we creating mutually beneficial alliances um, for 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 both parties? Sure. Uh, Rashmi, you want me to go first? You want to go first? Either way, either way. Please, please go ahead. I'll follow. I'll, uh, Bharat, let me start with uh, something which I've personally reflected on uh, when we've thought about these, uh, I would say not startups, but let's say new age businesses, right? Because some of these startups are now actually, for the lack of a better metric, more valuable than the larger businesses, let's put it this way, right? And, and I know we don't want to get into a debate on valuation. We'll all leave it for the next webinar. But Let's look at it this way, right? From a few years back, let's talk about digital for a moment, or let's talk about electric vehicles. This is going to take some more time. We've already seen, but let's talk digital, right? Today, we use digital as much as our older generation as well as our younger generation, right? So effectively, all these digital businesses are here to stay, and they've obviously created scale and they've created the right kind of uh, customer experience, and that is why they're flourishing. Um, and there are there are reasons why they have been able to scale up very fast to reach where they have. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of the larger groups, etc., who have taken a lot more time because obviously the world is changing, and hence uh, it's important to recognize that. But more important is not only to give them recognition, is to do partnerships with them, right? And truly, we live in a world where without being collaborative and without having the right partnerships, it's going to be difficult to succeed. Now, probably come to the specific question. I think if you see the specific question is. Uh, you've seen both sides, right? You have seen the larger, older businesses actually kind of come into partnerships, acquisitions, et cetera, with new businesses. And then you've seen the newer businesses, you know, whether it's in education or in financial services, then you're going to see a lot more in consumer businesses as well. Uh, and I'm sure Chandresh is working on multiple of those and Rashmi's portfolio of companies are being uh, quoted by a lot of the larger groups as well. Um, you will see vice versa as well. We've already seen a few of them. 
uh, you know, by Jews buying Akash was, let's say, one example I can talk about because we are not in Norway. Right? But there are enough and more out there in the market. I think the key is it has to be a two-way collaboration. What do you learn? Why do you do this? Um, the clear answer to that is because both sides, and going back to the point which I made earlier, and if you know, some of the panelists picked up, is it's a win-win for both. Both sides tend to gain. A larger group tends to learn how to build a business very quickly in terms of agility, how to take more entrepreneur and bold decisions rather than being very consensuous and you know taking your time. The third is how to actually build businesses where you're not only taking the economic risk all alone, but you know there are other providers of capital who are ready to provide you capital because you are the strategic and you know how to execute the plans better. So capital is not uh, a deterrent, right? Earlier, larger businesses have tended to say we will fund everything in our own equity is very dear, etc. I think that world has changed. What are the startups trying to get gain? Well, there is the ecosystem in place which the largest businesses bring on the table. You can really, really benefit from being a part of that ecosystem. I mean, you've seen it with whether it's Reliance doing a lot of acquisitions, startups doing a lot of acquisitions. We've done a few. I mean, publicly, which is known, we've invested in an agri tech startup, Cardinal Technologies. We've invested in a huge car platform, car and bike. Uh, we've invested uh, in in Porter, which is a Uber for the pickups vehicles uh, and, and the trucking business. And we've invested in First Strike, etc. So there are multiple more examples. The idea is that those businesses actually really benefit from being a part of the larger ecosystem of these large groups and really can help catapult their journey. I think the second is the governance structure and the depth of management capabilities and processes which these large groups bring. So I think, like I said, it's it's a very collaborative world we have to live in. And it, it's a very win-win proposition where both sides tend to gain uh, from this partnership. Rashmi, love to have your insights on this. No, I, I am a big fan of what's happening on this front, right? Uh, I think what an opportune day. Tata has come up with Tata new today. I, I haven't downloaded it. I hope, I don't know if the audience has, but that's a classic example of all of the brands of Tata, all of the acquisitions Tata just did whether it was CureFit, 1MG, Big Basket, coming onto one platform, understanding through the building blocks, kind of a mindset of a startup as to what the consumer wants, capitalizing on everything that Tata has on one platter and offering it to a consumer. I think that is phenomenal, right? Companies are looking at this as what is the best way to serve a market today. Startups are benefiting because they are getting competitive advantage thanks to a really large, large corporates backing them. They are, uh, and what we're increasingly seeing is, it's not just strategic acquisitions, right? Those those are happening, of course. I mean, that's what happened with Big Basket. But uh, you are also seeing, uh, as as Puneet rightly said, corporate venture capital, where very large corporates are now backing startups, saying, "We are your financial investors. We believe in your vision, but we believe we can also give you certain strategic advantages or strategic alliances, and back you." And we are happy to let you proceed to a public market stage or to where you can go public along the way. So it's a very collaborative uh, sort of an arrangement where startups can continue to function with the same culture, ethos, and uh, sort of passion that they were, are they able to create the products that were able they were able to create. And large corporates are able to then back that, like Puneet said, through the right governance structures. And at the end of the day, it's also ROI, right, for these very large corporates. I mean, you have these startups that have that have built value in a, in a very limited but very fast pace. So um, uh, the 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 outcomes are exponential, and and I think it it's 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 phenomenal to see what can happen from here. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And I think, you know, it's uh, it's interesting, right, because it goes back to conduct and strategic thinking and fitment in, in, in many ways. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, a high growth company only backed by venture capital and tomorrow the founder team says, look, uh, you know, I'm happy where I am. Right. Who's going to really test the drag? So having a strategic there as a buyer of last resort you know, in some ways is such a natural hedge, right, for the for the VCs to have as well. And I think hopefully we'll see this trend of, you know, more alliances grow uh, between the strategic world and the and the financial investment world. But to make it all happen, Anuj, I mean, you've got to get your structure right, right? So how how important is that on the buy side? And, you know, when, when do we get it done, you know, uh, after signing or what's the right time to get this going? Totally, totally. And Bharat, I'll take that question, but just to continue that excitement ahead, the point uh, that Rashmi mentioned, 
you know, I was with this client this morning who uses this term democratization of capital. And he says never before 20 in the Indian history, 20 years back, uh, all that was scarce was capital. And, you know, folks like us, when we got out of college, unless you had connection, unless you had a lot of legacy uh, capital, there was no way one could start business. And today what we only have in abundance is capital. And you see this uh, new unicorns being minted. So, you know, just carrying forward that excitement uh, that Rashmi uh, shared. But just uh, coming to the question that you are raising, I think, you know, again, uh, Puneet touched on it, Rashmi touched on it, that a successful deal always seeks to create a win-win situation for both buyers and sellers. And so if a successful deal is never a zero-sum game, it becomes very counterproductive and is against the interest of the parties if we don't get the structure right right at the beginning and then run into regulatory issues let's say at the 11th hour and if we then have to restructure the deal abort the deal for non-commercial reasons uh, so to your question as to how does one get the deal structure right very early i think this i think this can only be done by having an intimate understanding of what the buyer and the seller are trying to achieve through the transaction now as you uh, said in your opening remarks that no two deals are uh, similar and you know the reason why a buyer does a deal and why a seller does a deal can be significantly different. For example, a buyer could be doing a deal primarily to get access to a distribution network of the seller available with the seller, and seller may be looking to exit that vertical or to reduce debt. Or let's even look at the uh, HDFC merger, which was announced earlier this week, where Mr. Deepak Parekh says that this deal is like the child growing older and now acquiring the father's business. So you know it could be different reasons why deals are done. But the cardinal rule is that deals have to be win-win situations for both buyers and sellers. Uh, even in private equity context, let's say uh, when private equity provides capital to a company, it could be for that company to then act as a platform to undertake bolt-on deals and facilitate roll-up of a fragmented industry and achieve economies of scale. So reasons vary, but the cardinal rule remains the same. So once parties have decided that they want to go ahead with the deal, it is important I feel for advisors like us uh, to know the objective of the parties and finalize a structure which helps in closing the deal most expeditiously with lowest regulatory risks and exposure and with the least tax leakages. Uh, now, you know, quickly, we know that in India, typically we have three kinds of deals and then we have variations of those deals. These are mergers uh, where one company folds into the other. We have carve-out deals where you don't buy the entire company, but you buy a certain asset or a particular business. And when you, then you have share acquisitions where you invest in the entire company. It could be controlling stake, minority stake, but you buy the full company. Now, each of these structure has its own set of legal and regulatory and tax issues. For example, mergers need to be approved by courts, uh, and they require three-fourths of the shareholders by value approving the merger. Now, the court process could be a time-consuming process. Similarly, if you do a slump sale, and if the unit that is being slumped out is more than 20% of the net worth of the seller, then it requires special resolution. Again, it creates a lot of uncertainty. Then when it comes to share acquisition deals, you know, we have these laws, geopolitical issues. We have the press note three, where we have uh, now conditions saying that no Chinese company can invest in India without government of India's approval. Uh, and we know these approvals are far and few, not coming through. So, so all these things, issues need to be factored in and options and st structures need to be navigated to minimize the regulatory risk and exposure. So therefore, I feel getting the structure accurate at an early stage helps streamline the transaction documents and diligence. Also, what is important is that the transaction uh, documentation, diligence, the regulatory issues involved, all of them significantly vary depending on the nature of the transaction. So once the parties have agreed to go ahead, I think, you know, the advisors need to, uh, we need to rope in the best of the advisors, get the right structure so that the deal could be uh, closed most efficiently. Well, thanks, thanks, Anush. That was a great way to, you know, also wrap uh, Puneet's earlier point about the opportunity cost of M&A being so high that, you know, uh, one one just can't afford an amateurish approach to these uh, very, very sensitive matters that can have a significant rub on the transaction, transaction cost, transaction timeline, and how, how the team and the buyer is perceived, frankly. So, Prasenjit, you know, in terms of actually taking this one step forward, right, one often sees 
uh, you know, term sheets or uh, memorandums of understanding. Um, and, uh, you know, what, you know, could you, could you just comment on that in terms of their utility uh, and what are the issues to be mindful of if there is utility in these instruments and documents? Uh, thanks, Bharat. Well, I think the obvious question, response to your question is there is tremendous value, utility, and significance of having term sheets. So I think that's the first thing. These do have term sheets. Uh, you know, that's that's absolutely critical. Now, what value does it serve? I think let's put this in context. You know, I think a term sheet sets out a roadmap. You know, how the transaction should be done at a very high level. Uh, it sets out the in principle agreement which parties have done just when they have met. They have had a you know, kind of a handshake deal. It needs to be recorded, memorialized in this brief document. Uh, I will give you two illustrations to point what you should not do. I think one is don't be over prescriptive in a term sheet. I recall uh, there was a there were parties involved which were having a term sheet which ran into 25 pages, <clears throat> and they were just involving into protracted negotiation on virtually chapter and verse of every clause. And at the end of the day, what happened? Look, our clients who were the sellers from that deal. Uh, you know, they walked away and they they found a buyer who offered a more expeditious deal and they went ahead because the exclusivity was not there because one of the critical terms of a term sheet besides confidentiality is exclusivity, which is binding. And therefore, the, the uh, buyer had missed a bus because of a protracted negotiation. So don't be prescriptive. A term sheet is not meant to be a dress rehearsal for the definitive agreements. It's meant to set up the headline item. Equally, I think I remember one more transaction where the counterparty, the seller was so keen to really after the handshake deal straight away to show their books after an NDA saying, look, please do the diligence and let's do the definitive agreements in parallel. It was obviously, you know, anyone's guess what happened next. Lo and behold, uh, when the clients, our buyer proposed an earn out mechanism and a bit of a hold back, it came as a rude jolt. And, and the sellers were not prepared to, to do that, but well, they never bothered to discuss the key structural aspects in the term sheet. They straight away went to the dev docs, and well, unfortunately, they have to eat a humble pie, and, and it didn't go that well. I think it's still ongoing as I speak, so I can't speak more how it will end up, but, but really, it's not a conventional wisdom to straight away go to dev docs. You must have a term sheet. Don't be overly prescriptive. Outline the key terms and conditions and leave it at that have your three key binding terms there confidentiality exclusivity governing law and if you have break fee constructs do make them binding to give the teeth have a good governing law provision and move on to the next phase of dev talks structuring diligence and get it over the line what do you want thanks thanks Prasenji. and An anuj you know there is this uh, concept i mean we are talking about you know things that buyers can do but you know well advised and well planned sellers are integral to a well managed and tight deal process right and in that context vendor diligence has really emerged as a tool um, to facilitate m a m a transactions you know so how how important really is this and is is it really you know useful in any in any uh, manner or shape or what are your thoughts on this sure in my view Bharat, i feel vendor due diligence are a very effective tool if done well and i'll tell you why uh, there has been a uh, there is there is they've become very significant tools you know what has really changed in corporate india and the way we do business is that there's been a significant push by our government to increase the ease of doing business as we know and to make india an attractive investment decision and one thing i feel they've done really right is uh, we used to receive this flag all the time especially from foreign investors on questioning the enforceability of contracts governed by indian law and historically, Indian courts have slow and justice delivery system has been stymied with backlogs and all that stuff. But there was a sense that a contract is rarely going to see a court courtroom, uh, given the aversion of parties to approach court. And, uh, and, and people used to not pay as much attention, I would feel, even when I started profession, which is about 16, 17 years back. So it was always the thought that, look, we are never going to see the courts. Uh, because matters would get delayed by 20 years and 15 years. And what has significantly changed is several measures have been taken by government to adopt frameworks to strengthen existing laws. Uh, they have brought in commercial courts, they've set up specialized arbitral tribunals. More and more we see uh, that courts don't like interfering in arbitral awards. Contracts are getting enforced every day. We are having very progressive judgments. Recently, there was a judgment by the Bombay High Court 
where they have held that reliance on representations and warranties by an investor cannot be diluted even by the fact that a de detailed due diligence was done by the investor and an indemnity which has been offered to an investor to that investor still stands so you know a lot of these things that have changed have dramatically uh, increased enforceability of contracts uh, and therefore i feel when sellers and target companies are now offering reps and warranties uh, to a prospective buyer uh, they need to be very mindful and sure that what they offer uh, is true and accurate because uh, there is a good chance that if these are not accurate the contracts will be enforced and justice will be delivered speedy so i thought that was at a philosophical level what has changed and why vdd i feel has become very important because and the linkage with enforceability of contract now coming to uh, some legalese you know we all know that the underlying principle for due diligence is caveat tempter which is this latin maxim which says that buyers need to be aware of what they buy this principle is also enshrined this latin maxim principle is also enshrined in our sales of goods act of 1930 and then as mnas evolved we started seeing a lot of inefficiencies in the buyer diligence process where we saw that the sellers were always reactive uh, and they're only reacting to the questions raised by the buyers and then when we you know so advisors like ourselves we started coaching our clients on the sell side we said that it is not creating the level playing field and we need to be as proactive and there again vdd comes in very handy because if you've done the vdd you're on top of all the issues uh, and you know how to deal uh, with the questions that the buyer will ask. I think there are two types of M&A transactions uh, where we are seeing uh, BDD is very commonly used. These are bid situations and late stage startup fundraise. In both these transactions, these kind of transactions, BDD is helping increasing the time and efficiency of the process without eating into management time. Uh, quickly, what are the advantages of a BDD? Some of it I have covered, but uh, it also helps uh, the seller in fixing as many issues as possible prior to the transaction or before the buyer puts in a condition that these issues be rectified uh, as condition precedent to closing. So preemptively, we have resolved these issues if there is a thorough need. I know Maybe this was... Can, uh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, sorry, sorry, Anuj, I just had a thought yes. to what you just said. Sure. You know, since you touched upon uh, late stage startups uh, having doing these VDDs regularly, right? What we've seen is uh, it it helps on the in the on the efficiency front but going into the deal uh, you know each time simply relying on the vdd may not be an the absolute best approach to take as well and i'm saying this more from a buyer's perspective sure. because going in you know what your thesis for either backing the stake the equity stake or buying the product you know whatever it may be the asset is and therefore uh, we at least what we have seen is yes companies are now in fact the late stage companies are doing like a quarterly vdd and upping their DD exercise every quarter so that they're ready for the next fundraise. However, we do insist on another top up on the exercise that has already been run. And we examine it from the perspective of what we believe is the correct value proposition or where we believe or some of the levers that we want to examine right in the business, including any regulatory issues. So I think they're a great tool. But at least from the buyer perspective, one does want to go a step ahead and say, I may not just rely on that VDD, we'll take that as the base. And then let's work on what added checks and balances need to be done. Yeah, no, I think yeah, that's very... Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rashmi, thanks, Anuj. I think, uh, you know, that, that additional care that comes with institutional capital and where you're really in that fiduciary capacity of investing institutional capital is uh, you know is, is is definitely a dimension that that you know the, and one of the advantages for companies to actually raise institutional capital that you get that thorough check but you know that's at one end of the spectrum rashmi and you know punita i'll bring you in here as well but at the other end of the spectrum you have situations where there is absolutely no vendor data it could be because of reasons of confidentiality it could be for uh, process reasons uh, i mean i'm keeping aside you know distress but distress is another situation where sometimes you know the you know you just don't have the time to actually do a diligence because the company can slip into insolvency what should buyers do then are there any top tips for buyers any any recommendations yeah so i think you know and uh, very interesting i was listening to this conversation and then in a way in my mind i was thinking about what all other transactions we are evaluating as a group and how many there are vendor diligence and i 
I was struggling to find a few where there are vendor licenses, right? So this is a real life problem. Uh, or let me put it this way: Is that a real situation? The answer is absolutely yes. There is no uh, ambiguity around it. I think the question, at least when we look at it as a strategic buyer of assets, right, uh, is the question is how well do you know the asset, right? If you know the asset very well, for instance, if I am lack of a better example, if I'm looking to acquire something in my farm business uh, and the player is a small competitor, but is a competitor, uh, well, through my existing business network, my knowledge of the market, my knowledge of you know the distributors, etc., I know enough about the business, uh, which will probably be much more. And most in most situations, I will have employees of that business actually working with me because you know they would have worked with me and kind of change jobs. So I would probably know more about them and what then a vendor diligence report will say. So I'm not negating the impact of a vendor diligence. So I think it's the point I'm making is a lot of times uh, I think businesses have to going back to the earlier point about you know how do you structure a deal and it has to be win-win. You have to figure out whether a vendor diligence is really a requirement or it's just I definitely need a vendor diligence because you know that is what ought to be provided. I think that is you need to make that differentiation, right? Can you do a transaction without a vendor diligence? And if I know the asset very well, why do I need a real vendor? If I'm getting into a new area in terms of a new sector altogether where I don't know the asset or the industry well or a new geography altogether where I know the industry but I just don't know you know anything about the pastry or the shareholders or how the business performance has been etc etc then a vendor diligence becomes very critical so I think first is distilling where vendor diligence is required and where not required and secondly where it is required but not available to your specific point well there are various ways around it right first is you know we can obviously think about insurance secondly in the contract uh, which you're doing for the documentation of the transaction you can put in certain terms etc uh, which can kind of protect uh, from a future downside performance because of certain disclosures etc which were not made previously I think the third is uh, you can probably will have to spend a little more effort and probably cost to kind of get your diligence done where there is no real vendor diligence done and I think the fourth and uh, which is being increasingly used and now it is being accepted by a lot of the uh, sellers as well uh, is and that's just a sign of the maturity of the market which one of the pa fellow panelists uh, spoke about is kind of seeing earn out call, come hold back kind of structures uh, which will kind of be linked to future performance or future liabilities etc not arising and hence adjustments being made uh, which kind of compensates for the lack of a very detailed vendor diligence about the business or the other aspects uh, you know commercial or otherwise uh, financial etc as well so I think there are some levers available but at the end of the day a lot of times it's also about your gut feel about the business and going ahead and take, doing it and there is I think there is appetite to kind of reach that midway and say we want a swift transaction diligence doesn't really make sense so do you then do a staggered payout do you hold back some in escrow like Puneet said at least I would say that appetite is there and people would rather if they don't foresee too much of risk close it then probably do something later, find the gap, and just stagger the payout with some insurance backup. That should work. And if, and if I can make one comment, like 30 seconds, you know, for exactly what uh, Rashmi is saying, Chandresh is saying, in my experience also, I find it's the seller who benefits more from a vendor due diligence. He gets an opportunity to put his house in order. And I know in one of the earlier sessions last year, I think Hegri made that example. And I was part of that session. We did a DD on a promoter company, a legacy company, uh, been in ex existence for decades, which was about to be sold, uh, control D. And in a, uh, the promoter was initially very resistant to the idea of us doing a VDD. But when we did the DD, we found that promoter's house, which was very expensive, one of these Lut Lutian Delhi type property, was sitting in one of the subsidiaries of the company that was about to be sold. And, uh, and everyone found that it was a good value. So sometimes I've also felt in reality it's the seller who benefits more, uh, and if it's not a thorough VDD, actually it's uh, it's not it's, it may be counterproductive and doesn't help the buyers much. But the sellers definitely benefit uh, by having that opportunity to fix their house. Over yeah, thanks. Know. No, really, really, uh, really helpful, uh, Chandresh. If I could, you know, ask you. Um, uh you know how how do buyers really mitigate against um, the risk of a deal ultimately falling apart right you've sort of committed to this process you're all out there maybe there's an announcement maybe there's a leak uh, but you're really visible with the deal what do you what do you do if there's a risk that it fails or it actually fails how, how can buyers improve their position 
So the the first thing that happens, uh, Bharat, is 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 uh, you guys, i.e., the lawyers, you know, come up with a documentation which is which probably has put a number of uh, you know tick boxes and all the essential items that need to be met. Uh, what we are talking about is from then is from signing to closing or from a point of a handshake to a, or call it a, a binding handshake to actually the closing of the transaction and that's where you know one has to look at the risk uh, that's where one has to look at the items that need to be uh, you know met uh, conditions that need to be adhered to uh, to effect a, a proper closing and the handover uh, you know of the asset and i guess uh, there are there are therefore items which are procedural there are items which are you know not in control uh, of either of the parties, i.e., some of the the regulations and regulatory approvals and the like, which nobody can, you know, underwrite or guarantee. And there are items which probably are, you know, manageable. But then, you know, these are items which probably at some point and things go south. For example, uh, you know, something happens where you know uh, the the party doesn't want to close the transaction. Then what do you do? I think there are concepts, uh, you know, such as uh, you know break fees which come into play. Uh, you know, in, in such situations where, for whatever reason, uh, if the deal doesn't happen, uh, then, I mean, in most cases, it is the seller who says that I don't want to close the deal. Uh, you know, either, you know, a shareholder has raised, uh, you know, an issue or or there is an opportunity uh, which comes up, things change. So, uh, but but then what, what buyers tend to do is to is to look at a big fee which the seller has to pay. It is It is more of a penalty. It is more to keep everybody in check. Uh, it is a deterrent enough uh, for uh, you know the parties to go uh, close the deal in the right earnest. Uh, you know after a lot of time and effort uh, you know has been uh, put to work uh, effectively. So I think a break fee is something which is a uh, you know a, a, a significant uh, a deterrent as such uh, for parties to walk away uh, from from a transaction which has been uh, you know rightfully agreed to. I would say that is that is one of the biggest things that we've seen. Uh, it works quite well. The, Amounts can be as high as 10% of deal values. One has seen that, uh, you know, uh, in vogue in global MNAs, where big fees have run into hundreds of billions of dollars. But it is something which is working in 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 our context as well. Uh, you know, where big fees become, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an integral part of uh, any any part of a transaction documentation. Yeah, yeah, and there are so many different variations of this. You know, there are companies that actually pay a fee to being looked at. Uh, you know, because you may precipitate a process as a result of that, because there's now interest, and you know, there's a there's a very reputable strategic or uh, growth fund looking at you. So, uh, very very interesting uh, comments. I think I think Puneet, you know, earlier in the conversation, you know, you talked about priorities, and I think prioritization is such a such an important aspect. And I, you know, uh, would would maybe welcome some comments from you know from 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 rashmi from you Purit, or chandresh you know in terms of um uh, you know negotiations and 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 you know really mistakes that you see being made you know in the you know in the zoom room or in the in the boardroom as as negotiations really take place where where buyers tend to get get a few things wrong uh, that that some of our uh, audience can can take back and keep in mind as they negotiate their m a deals Oh, you want should, to, should, should, should I start? All right. Okay. I think communication is key. So as soon as you reach to the process where you're into the transaction documents, you need to have the fundamentals laid down very clearly, right? Where is it that there is no compromise on either, either party's side, I think, has to be known, right? You cannot have any title risk if you're acquiring shares. If you're acquiring an asset or a product, the IP needs to be absolutely sacrosanct, right? Uh, once you've set the ground rules right, you can't have a title risk. You can't have large regulatory exposures, right? You need to be, you need to have crossed these hurdles before you come to the transaction document stage. So a lot of times what we try and do is just figure out what could be the potential large gaps, try and ad address them beforehand, and then come to the documentation stage where it is more about actually laying down what you've agreed. Having said that, I think excessive uh, with due respect to lawyers, bankers, everybody, excessively lawyering documents can be a massive issue for, for sellers. Uh, excessive focus on CPs and CSs. By excessive, I mean not taking practical approaches, right? What CP could be a deal breaker and which CP should be a regulatory process, which could be pushed a little further down the line. And uh, I think some very, very uh, straight conversations around what is not acceptable, right? 
what is not acceptable is any kind of a fraudulent intent there will be no compromise on that there is no point in bringing that discussion to the fag end of some eod clause in an agreement and then debating over it right so i think if you are very clear that risk of title pricing uh, a certain tax exposure and regulatory issues as long as you are able to secure those and are able to kind of give some and take some i think one should be able to cut through a negotiation process very swiftly and i would say if you can meet in person frankly and try and eliminate most of them in in a closed room nothing like it but not not all have the benefit of that so those are my two cents yeah, i think uh, probably keep the answer short uh, at least from my experience what has worked is uh, having a good understanding of each other before you get into the negotiation room you should negotiate only when you understand each other i think the way you understand it is as a buyer or as a seller of asset it's very important for me to prioritize must have good to have and it's fine i don't i don't have it you don't need to make that list for yourself you need to make it for your counterparty as well obviously the counterparty will not make it and give it to you but you need to be able to assess through the strategic objectives very initially very early on what is it that is must have for me and what is it that is must have for them and at least in my limited experience i have found usually those lists are not very overlapping usually the good to have and not to good to have are what the must has for, for the other side are and hence it is important that you kind of you know uh, marry those two and when you go into a negotiation room like you would do in any situation you will negotiate the hell out of every clause and you will trade off but it is important to know that what is my must have and what can i what will he or she trade off from there not so good to not so must have and vice versa and that is how a negotiation will get concluded so it's very important to have your priorities clear but also very important to have a good understanding of what the priorities of the other side are and only then a negotiation will be successful otherwise you can keep blowing your own trumpet without the other five people even realizing that this person is interested in doing a transaction when your whole intention might not be malified so probably hopefully at least that's the way we approach or i like to approach situations yeah, I, I, no, I think, I think that's absolutely, great. absolutely agree, Puneet. I think that is that is actually you hit it right, right there. I guess the mutual respect for each other during an uh, during a negotiation is is the, the the supreme mantra. I would say that is something which you have to go in with. I think if you go into a negotiation or into uh, you know into any sort of a discussion in an accusatory or or as a as as a police to say that you know you've done wrong and let me kind of point out uh, you know some of the negative things about you it, it's not going to go well so i think that is the first and the foremost thing the second thing is 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 also about i guess and this tends to happen a lot that uh, you know uh, there is always this underlying theme that a number of uh, or or probably i mean it's it's natural it's human that buyers uh, you know would first kind of negotiate get a position agreed to and then after some point in time, after they go home, uh, you realize that, uh, oh, can I reopen that issue? Can I get something more? So you tend to, you know, over negotiate, uh, you know, a position, which is absolutely a no-no. I think, uh, like, like Puneet mentioned, always useful to, to have what is important, what is post-critical, what is good to have, what is something which is great if you can get it, uh, but not, not necessary. And I guess the third thing is, is about this feeling uh you know that that often again i'm i'm not abusing buyers it is human uh it's it's really you are more interested in knowing how much is a seller gaining uh than understanding how much am i gaining right i i think it is something where uh and, and that's why you find tend to negotiate more and more i guess it's it's something that probably you know happens a lot uh in an indian buyer context uh where we try to analyze uh, you know a lot about how much is the seller going to take home then saying that how much more am I going to gain out of this acquisition? So probably at some point in time you have to draw a line rather than extending a negotiation. And like Puneet said again, and and I guess even even Rashmi said that uh, you know if you extend this too much, then the deal is bound to fail. So I guess it's it's just being sensible about the whole thing. Yeah, just keeping uh, one eye on the clock. I can see that uh, you know we're now approaching the tail end of this uh, panel session. I've got a few questions uh, you know from the audience. So let me try and take them. And uh, maybe, maybe Chandresh, I can put this one to you in terms of post-closing integration uh, for the success of an M&A transaction. Um, maybe you could comment on that. 
Oh yeah, surely. And and uh, I guess it's an important thing because when when one is absorbing or taking over a company, uh, it's most useful to uh, you know first as a part of the diligence get an understanding of or there has to be a plan as to how the integration is to happen. What is the top management like? Who are the key participants in the top management and how they're going to fit into the uh, into the groove of of uh, the 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 uh, buyer as such. Uh, and and that is that is important. Uh, communication is important just to give them comfort that uh, you know they are going to be well taken care of and what is their role going forward. So planning uh, ahead is quite useful. What we often see is some sort of a transition agreement uh, where uh, often if you have a, a seller which is an owner manager uh, kind of a company, uh, then the transitioning is something that is agreed to upfront. Maybe it's a period of typically around a year, year and a half or so. For the businesses to be, uh, you know, nicely transitioned in the hands of the new owner. But uh, I guess I mean it's it's the the whole bit about uh, again communication. Uh, very important to have, uh, you know, the right communication. Have the town halls, uh, you know, uh, to to kind of uh, talk about uh, how how the new team uh, is coming in, uh, being a little more kind of uh, welcoming and the like. So I guess uh, you know the org structure, etc. All that if it is planned. Uh, quite in advance it is it is always uh, helpful uh, so that there is absolute uh, understanding about the roles and responsibilities and objectives uh, that one is looking forward to i think bharat yeah. also the brand integration right how the brand depending on which brand who's acquiring whom how that integrates over time i think that's very crucial and also a lens on what that means for customers um, if that can also be integrated well and sort of communicated, I think it goes a long way. Yes, and particularly, you know, in this uh, environment that we've lived through post-COVID, then there's been so much of uh, many activity that has happened. So integration to make those acquisitions successful is is, is such a paramount feature. Uh, Prasenjit and Anuj, maybe you can comment on this. Uh, Prasenjit, you could kick us off, but, you know, so much of time is spent on the negotiation table, you know, talking about pre-closing conditions uh, but you know what can be done really and how can these be prioritized so that you know one can actually get the deal done as in you know closing done and you know you get on with the integration and we're really running the business any any tips any thoughts yeah no i think that's that's i think so critical and one of the <coughs> art of negotiation is to really get this right because i think uh, many a times deals are killed in the over exuberance of showing the leverage as a buyer that look each and everything is a condition precedent that's absolutely the wrong way and wrong approach uh, i will give you an example of shops and establishments act with all due respect to the legislation the consequences are very benign you know and that really can take time to regularize two three months you don't want to put a mnf deal on hold to regularize these kind of issues which have no bearing either from a risk or value standpoint it's just an example nothing against the act per se but please be careful what are cps does it really impact your value does it really impact your risk? Can it be resolved through an alternate structure mechanism if it's going to take an enormous amount of time? That's the first point, I think. <clears throat> the second I remember is, is even dealing with customers. There was a, a customer contract, not critical, not adding to the pie, but the buyer insisted, no, the seller must go and talk to the customer prior to closing. And guess what happened? The customer used that to strong arm. The seller jacked up the price and that really had a unnecessary bad taste in the mouth of the seller right because that was not required it was not a key customer not in top 10 it could have easily had a sidebar uh, with the with the customer and dealt with in a tactful manner very important you don't make everything into cp uh, and and bulldoze your way that's not the right approach be judicious again a good set of advisors this comes not from college classes but really experience and gray hair and really good set of advisors can guide you well Anuj, would you like to add anything? No, uh, just that I think PC covered it well, Bharat. Uh, you know, I, I have nothing further to add. Just that uh, you know, it needs uh, one should. Uh, also, you know, if I have to add, it's totally. It's no longer a buyer's market. Uh, uh, you know, we have to just remind ourselves that ways of past will not work, as PC was saying. We cannot just bulldoze the seller with unreasonable asks because many other marquee investors may be chasing your target and we see it all the time you read something in the press on economic times that somebody is talking about some with someone on a deal and five days later somebody else has done it so we have to just be practical and mindful and pc present gave great insight 
Yeah, uh, we've got, uh, you know, maybe just a couple of minutes before before we have to end the panel. I've got one eye on the clock, but maybe we have, you know, a minute to squeeze in a question. So, Anoj, I'm going to shoot this one right back at you. It's, um, uh, you know, it's 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 uh, one of the one of the audience questions on how frequently do you see uh, W and I uh, on private M&A deals in India? Is that a common feature now? Uh, what what are your comments on that? How often do you see it? I mean, Bharat, I should say I mean, because you know this is a subject close to my heart, and I do several of these W and I insurances. We should know that last year all insurances insurers ran out of their capacity. So the premium that was being offered at 2-3% of deal size shot up to towards the end of December at 9% and 10% because the insurers had maxed out of their capacity. So it's it's still very common uh, for financial sponsors. Uh, uh, they are the ones who uh, seek these uh, uh, insurance, but but it is it is considerably picking up and I, I think it will become a very prominent feature uh, in several of our. Yeah, uh, thanks, 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 Anush, for that. Um, I think uh, you know we're uh, probably a few minutes um, uh, to go for the end of the session. I suppose I have two duties at this point in time. One is, of course, to thank my panel for uh, their phenomenal insights uh, into the M&A process from a buy side, whether it's uh, you know conceptualizing the transaction, thinking about bid conduct, thinking about bid uh, financing. Sorry, just bear with me. Uh, the problems of uh, the virtual world, um, but uh, um, and uh, you know, but 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 you know, equally in terms of I think some of the very insightful points on look what is likely to be acceptable to the other side, in terms of really getting the deal done and the negotiation done. Um, so thank you, thank you very much to the panel. I'd also like to thank the audience uh, for their participation, for their Q and A, for taking the time to sign up. Each of you will receive. A feedback form it will take less than a minute to fill this out so please do go ahead and fill it out please also set out any preferences or tips that you have for us to make this series more effective going forward uh, thank you everyone for your attendance today and uh, wish you all the best and stay safe thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thanks, thank you. bye bye thank you. Bye.